Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Digital Conference. This is the first time in 15 years uh, that the conference has been held virtually. And today is our final day of five days of the conference. Uh, we've been doing two hours a day with a different theme each day. Um, during today's two hours, we have a keynote speech uh, from uh, a minister, Matt Warman. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. And then we have a fantastic panel with uh, four leading figures in the smart city, smart places uh, world. And I'm very much looking forward to that as well today. Uh, we've also got two rounds of table working. So there'll be two 15 minute sessions where you can network and meet each other and talk about the topics that we're talking about on stage today. Uh, we're using the hashtag uh, DigiLeaders. So do, if you'd like to tweet, do please tweet using that. Um, so today we're in the Digi Lounge, hashtag Digi Lounge. It's a real time face to face interaction space that makes virtual networking feel natural and fun. And we're arranged over several floors today. So there's lots of room for you to move around. Per table, you can talk with five others at any time. Uh, to move tables, when you're back in the room in networking mode, you just put your mouse on the table you'd like to move to and double click and you'll find yourself joining that table. So right now we're in broadcast stage mode. Everyone in the room is now tuning into this one view. Uh, you'll notice on the right hand side, you now have three tabs, general chat with the room. Uh, please use this for general chat, general questions, comment, uh, and saying hello. Thank you, Treen. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're very welcome today. The second is participants. If you click on participants, you'll see that you'll find rather handily everybody in the room uh, arranged alphabetically so that even though we're in stage mode, you can still send the messages and set up meetings for when we get to networking mode. Uh, and third and finally, we have Q&A, question and answer. Please use this for questions to us on the stage uh, when we're talking. So we'll let you know when we're looking for questions from the audience uh, and please do send those up. And you'll also see that uh, when people raise questions, that you can vote for them. So if someone puts a question up you really like, just click on the vote button. It'll get lots of votes and it'll make its way to the top. And that'll be the question that we ask here on the stage. Um, the other feature we have down the bottom here is we have the raise your hand feature. This means that you in the room can contact us on stage. Um, and perhaps can I ask, please, can you raise your hand if you've been to all five days of the conference? No, I'm not. Oh, we do. David Cooper, you get the prize. Well done. Well, I'm very impressed you've been to all five days. We have had five cracking days. So we'll be using that feature uh, later on to get you up on stage to talk to everyone and to feedback on what you've been talking about today. Thank you to today's sponsors and partners, Nominet uh, and Treehouse Innovation. Uh, they are our sponsors. They make this possible. They have a couple of banners in the room. And if you click on those banners, you'll find that rather than just being static, they're interactive. You can click through and see other information. So let's get on to today's conference, Smarter Places. The pandemic of the last three months has hit our cities and our places and how they operate at every level. Societal, public transport, entertainment, offices, how people communicate and how can we make them more resilient? Can cities, can our countryside as a smart place use data and technology to create new efficiencies, improve sustainability, create economic development and enhance the quality of life factors for people living and working in them in, can I use the dreaded phrase, the new normal? Um, so to begin the conference and to give this morning's keynote, we're thrilled to have with us Matt Warman, MP, Minister for Digital Infrastructure at DCMS. Uh, of course, all of us uh, have seen a renewed focus on the importance of connectivity. Um, so it's incredibly timely and appropriate to have the minister with us. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Um, well, we can see and hear you. You'll be pleased to hear. So very, very much looking forward to your remarks. Can I just say to the audience that if you do have questions that occur to you while the minister is addressing us, do please put them in. And after Matt's speech, I will return to the stage. And if we've time, we'll take a few of those questions. So, Minister, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much. And it's a uh, it's great pleasure to join this uh, digital stage. Um, obviously, uh, this is, as you say, part of the new normal. Uh, and I'm very glad that this 
conference is going ahead. And, and, and the fact that we're doing this in this way is just one of the many ways uh, that COVID-19 has re-emphasized the incredible importance of telecoms uh, to the UK. Uh, more than ever now, communities, businesses, vital public services, we're all dependent on that digital connectivity. And the crisis has uh, meant that people are now, millions of people are now continuing to work, to access education, to speak to the people they love using digital. And it's come at a real uh, point that, that emphasizes that it, it, technology is now able to do things that just a short while ago uh, it wasn't able to do. And I think that is a, a lesson that will reverberate around business and around the broader economy. Um, the, the telecoms industry has been a hugely valuable partner in the past few months in helping to maintain the resilience of that network um, and ensure pr uh, continued connectivity for public services and, and for uh, the school children and for consumers across the UK. And, and one of the earliest questions that faced us uh, was whether that network would hold up to those massive increases in, in home working, because despite the uh, enormous scale of, of the furlough scheme and, and, and all of that, we all know that a huge number of people are obviously continuing uh, the jobs that they did uh, previously, but they're doing it from home. And as the COVID-19 period has shown, actually in the UK, we do have an incredibly resilient broadband network that has handled home working, online learning and, and leisure usage on a really mass scale, um, especially given it was built to support evening peaks uh, around the streaming of uh, sporting events or, or films or, or whatever. Um, and the load across the day has really grown, but we've also still had that uh, evening peak. So while we've seen that we do have the headroom to deal with massively increased internet use uh, from home, um, it's encouraging to see operators have put to some extent competitiveness aside, have worked together and have ensured real network resilience. Um, but it was also uh, important that operators were able to rectify any outages, to mitigate any effects of uh, the degradation that inevitably does occur to some extent over the duration of the emergency period. Um, and obviously, uh, the access to sites from field engineers remains crucial. And, and so uh, we took a, a couple of steps to try and help that, um, making telecoms workers, including uh, some call center workers who have a vital role to help in uh, helping uh, vital role to play in helping members of the public uh, uh, were classified as key workers. We clarified guidance for local authorities, the police and landlords about access for essential workers. And we've worked with the sector to ensure those workers are following government guidance, of course, but are able to provide what is now more than ever a vital service, keeping the internet up and running. So, so a, a huge thank you from uh, all of us here across government uh, to those that have kept us connected uh, through that difficult time. Um, and the paramount importance of keeping our telecoms network secure and resilient and the vital work that telecoms workers do in ensuring this makes it all the more disturbing to hear of reports of attacks on critical infrastructure and key workers during the COVID period. Some of these incidents obviously inspired by conspiracy theories circulating online. Um, I, I suspect there are not many people are watching this who think there is a credible uh, link between 5G and coronavirus, but the fact is uh, that these baseless conspiracy theories uh, have been uh, given wider circulation than they should have been over the course of this uh, crisis. We know uh, obviously that threats or violence towards any key worker or damage to mobile phone masts can't be tolerated. On only the other day we had the first uh, conviction for damage to telecoms infrastructure over the uh, over, over this period. I think that is a hugely positive uh, step to uh, have taken. It's a hugely a positive thing to be able to point to. Um, and, and the police have uh, been really uh, good in the uh, eyes of the industry, I'm told, uh, and the way that they've responded to this. So most cases of, of damage have regrettably been extensive and they have been costly. Um, and those responsible for those criminal acts rightly face uh, the full force of, of the law, and that will, of course, continue. That we're trying to uh, build up a full picture of the inaccurate uh, news stories and posts about the virus circulating online, flagging content to social media platforms, making sure it's removed as quickly 
as it possibly can be because it is uh, I think we all know it's hugely damaging when we see uh, the good work uh, that networks have done that I talked about a minute ago being undermined by the action of a small number uh, of criminals. Um, I think it's also important to say, though, that uh, while the resilience of the network has held up well, we've also uh, worked really hard to ensure that people have been able to maintain their services throughout the pandemic and support uh, make make sure that we support those who need it most. Uh, that's why there was a, a package very early on announced to, with telecoms operators to support vulnerable consumers and frontline staff. Um, we've also announced a similar package to ensure vulnerable and disadvantaged children have access to the educational resources they need. Um, uh, very recently, we've announced that uh, the, the uh, resources around domestic violence uh, are now also free to access um, online. So that's a very important uh, move from industry and I think we should all welcome that. It's just one demonstration of how things have worked well together. Um, we've also um, uh, of course worked hard um, on the uh, priorities that go beyond uh, COVID because making sure that everyone across the country has the connectivity they need for modern life is now more important than ever, more obvious than ever. Um, and we're absolutely con committed even through this uh, to deliver the world-class infrastructure that we need in the UK so that people are able to stay connected and businesses are able to grow which are, of course is going to be crucial as we face difficult economic times. We still want to bring absolutely uh, the faster gigabit capable broadband to the whole country um, as soon as possible. That means establishing the UK as a global leader in 5G. We've seen some significant announcements from some providers about their investment in this country already um, and ensuring that the majority of the UK uh, population has access to a 5G signal by 2027, but a lot of progress being made there already and on on gigabit broadband itself uh, we've already seen uh, according to ofcom 12 percent of the uk having access to full fiber if you take in uh, virgin then that gets you uh, to a figure of around 19 percent now that is uh, not uh, where we would like it to be of course it isn't but it is really significant progress um, uh, from where we were just a short while ago and we've now got 5g in over 70 uk towns and cities with lots more to come so I think it's important that we do understand that progress is really meaningful. Um, I think uh, if you ask any member of parliament, then uh, there are still, however, very clearly areas where there is a lot more to do. Uh, so, so there is uh, an obvious need to help the private sector to boost the build rates that we see already going uh, up. And there's an obvious need for government to take as much action uh, as we can. And that's what we're committed to do. We've seen the, um, for, to take one example, the telecoms infrastructure um, in leasehold properties bill was uh, almost literally the first piece of legislation put through uh, Parliament by this government in the uh, distant days before COVID was, was a significant issue. We're going to legislate to mandate gigabit connectivity in new build premises, um, and we're working on reforming streetworks regulations so that the physical build um, can get easier. And we don't think, uh, of course, that the private sector can deliver this nationwide coverage alone. That's why there's uh, five billion pounds in funding to subsidize development to the hardest to reach parts of the country on top of uh, not far off two billion pounds of the super fast broadband program that's been going since 2010 and now sees 96% of the UK with super fast coverage. And with mobile coverage, of course, the shared rural network will see the four mobile operators uh, collectively invest more than half a billion pounds in a shared network. And on top of that, there'll be half a billion pounds of public money uh, that seeks to almost uh, entirely eliminate uh, the total not spots that are so frustrating for all of us. That's another billion pounds of joint investment to increase 4G mobile coverage. And, and of course, that looks forward to 5G mobile coverage as well. Um, the 5G test beds and trials program uh, is, is the current main mechanism for doing this. And we've got uh, not far off the uh, 5G create a 30 million pound open competition that will be uh, announcing uh, some uh, successful bidders in, in July. It's an open competition that aims to attract businesses from a wide variety of industries where the UK has a competitive advantage and encouraging dynamic new business models that really take advantage uh, of 5G. Just a couple of words on, on some other things that 
we're doing, looking forward, we're keen to explore further measures to enable faster and easier deployment of broadband. I've asked the industry uh, to try and think the unthinkable, to come up with their wish list of what they would like government to do to try and provide the very best possible landscape. I can't promise to uh, agree to every request, of course, but uh, what, what I think we do need to do is take advantage of the fact that there is clear evidence of the vital importance of this kind of infrastructure. We want to uh, promote greater infrastructure sharing between telecoms operators and other utility companies. Um, today, uh, uh, we, we've been talking about what uh, we could do, for instance, putting broadband um, in uh, uh, using the other ducts that are available. Um, and I suppose uh, the uh, extraordinary crisis has, however, uh, got me out of having to do a photo shoot, probably in a sewer, demonstrating that that sort of infrastructure could be used uh, for deploying broadband. So there are uh, th there are some very small mercies in these extraordinary times. Um, and of course, we want to work across government and industry to move uh, those who have found themselves unemployed as a result of the COVID uh, crisis into seeking the opportunities, into finding the opportunities uh, of uh, the new uh, recruitment that will be required to, gr to grow our broadband network. So just to close, I, I would say, of course, COVID has promoted an extraordinary shift that would have taken years in other circumstances, um, uh, has taken place over just a few weeks. Uh, we need to make sure that we understand the long-term consequences of that. We need to make sure that we uh, make sure that we uh, provide every possible opportunity to uh, the industry and the sector more broadly and roll out broadband that is more obviously important now than ever. And I hope uh, that uh, anyone listening to this call would, would, would not just uh, agree with that sentiment, but also would be keen to engage in a process that will see government try and crowdsource as many of the best possible ideas as we can so that we get that uh, na nationwide upgrade going as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt for uh, uh, giving, giving that speech. So now we do have a, a little time, you're with us for a little longer. Um, I'm gonna do the chair's prerogative before we get on to some of our audience questions. So uh, it must be exciting. I mean, your background, you were telegraph technology correspondent. Is that right for? Yes, well, yes. Yeah. So, so, so I, I was lucky enough to be uh, in charge of the Telegraph's tech coverage, roughly from the launch of the iPlayer through to the launch of the Apple Watch. And if you come through, if you sort of imagine what happened in that period, then it was a it was an extraordinary time. So uh, absolutely. So I just wondered, uh, my first quick question is kind of what's it like to be the other end of that tunnel with your <laughs> with your hands on the levers of of change? And uh, yeah, sort of how how positive and frustrating is that at the same time? <laughs> um, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I wouldn't overestimate the uh, instant effect of those levers. Go, go, uh, I think a lot of people imagine that sort of uh, government sits there and thinks today I shall do this and it happens instantly. Of course, that, that's not and that's not really how anyone uh, that thinks about it knows it works, but it, it is a difficult uh, transition in, in, in some levels. But I think what's interesting about uh, the shift from journalism to, to government for me in many ways actually has been that it's not uh, as significant uh, a change in uh, lifestyle and, and sentiment as, as some people might imagine it is. For me, journalism was always about trying to uh, demonstrate that there was a, a broad basis of, of sentiment behind a certain idea when we were talking at The Telegraph for a long time about how important it was uh, to roll out broadband to rural areas in particular at a faster rate. Um, now I find myself um, in, a, in an odd way having to uh, do similar things, having to try and corral the, the industry, regulators, uh, um, government, um, landowners, all of that um, onto the same page so that we can go as, as quickly as possible. Um, obviously there are different and more significant levers uh, available, but uh, it is not that dissimilar. And then a, a slight follow-up, to what extent has COVID-19, um, you know, attached the electrodes to some of our large incumbents and, you know, some of that big infrastructure to, to get it moving? Do you sort of feel there's a sentiment in the country that some of those key players can't resist and their own staff and organisational structures are, are kind of changing? And are we going to see something, you know, this thing accelerate? So I think there's a question in there about can funding be reallocated from physical to digital infrastructure 
you know, are we going to see, I, this is a sort of a slightly unfair question, I'm not expecting you to tell us whether what's going to happen with HS2, but do you think there will be more emphasis on, you know, the infrastructure required to drive a home working economy and, you know, a, a new normal, as, as you said at the start? Yeah, well, so I, th I think there are two things. I think the the Prime Minister's pre-COVID very clear commitment to uh, a nationwide broadband upgrade uh, had already galvanised the industry to a quite significant extent. Um, and that will very much continue. I, I think what you've also seen, though, is yes, there, there is obviously even greater sympathy to this cause across government. Um, and I think while that doesn't, uh, that shouldn't, in my own mind, that shouldn't take away from other important infrastructure projects we do we don't win by doing one thing but not another but i think what it should do um certainly from my perspective is uh, make uh, government even more willing to uh, say well those regulatory changes that have perhaps made things a little bit harder can we make can, can we ease those so that the industry has uh, every possible opportunity to invest the money that we know that industry very often wants to invest uh, and wants to get out the door as quickly as possible um government is of course keen to expand our own uh, role in this. Um, and I think what we're going to see, uh, as I say, as a result of uh, asking the industry to say, what is the what is the longest possible wish list? You're going to see some more uh, interesting developments on that relatively soon. Yeah. So uh, Matt, we both believe in democracy and with six votes at the top of the, at the top of the Q and A we have, how do you think the loss of income from lower tourism, use of public transport and the increase in remote working will affect cities' abilities to invest in smart projects? Good, so a good it, question, yeah. It, 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 it is a good question, actually. And, and, and I think, um, obviously, we're going to see over the long term um, fewer people, certainly certainly over the medium term, and I think the, the long term is, is, is a conversation up for grabs, um, fewer people going into offices with tens of thousands of people on public transport in the way that they used to. Um, on the other hand, we're also going to see an increased desire for those cities to be smart cities in, in both the sort of uh, colloquial sense and, and the technical sense. Uh, and I think investing in, in that is something where we're going to see much greater interest. If you look at a lot of the government funding that is out there, it is actually, whether it's the Stronger Towns Fund, whether it's uh, uh, some of the uh, reopening the high streets funding, it is actually quite closely focused on increasing digitization of cities and of the high street and, and of uh, areas where we, we should have been doing it uh, even faster some years ago, I think. So uh, it will it will make a difference, yes, but I think I wouldn't necessarily make the direct link that the question makes between the number of people using public transport and the ability to invest. I, I'd say this is already very much the direction of travel and we will be accelerating it. But the, the one small caveat I would add is we also need to make sure that when it comes to smart cities in particular, we do them in a way that is uh, secure from a cyber point of view as well. So, um... A lot of those business cases for making that investment is based on the fact that cities, you know, have tens, hundreds of thousands of people in very close proximity. So your investments in masts can connect and, and drive revenue from large number of pe numbers of people. So there's a, the question in here about kind of, you know, how are we how are we going to rethink those business models? And mm. can we rethink those business models where the rural I think there's a question in here, uh, rural and coastal regions you know, kind of get start to get investment because I guess the challenge is that the return on investment is going to be more evenly spread across the UK than perhaps the kind of low hanging fruit of a large city has been in the past. So, you know, are you going to have to subsidise in new ways or or cajole with grants in new ways? Well, so, so I, I think the, 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 the honest answer is we know that where is an economically viable place to invest when it comes to rolling out this infrastructure will have shifted somewhat over the course of this crisis and as a result of the consequences of this crisis. But it is too early to say actually the long term effect on commuting patterns means that the commuter belt has expanded by such and such a distance. And therefore, we would say that's an area that was commercially viable uh, or, or more likely wasn't commercially viable um, and now is But when it comes to rolling out that sort of investment. But that's absolutely where we're thinking, because what I really don't want to do is five billion pounds is a really significant 
amount of money, um, uh, but we have to make sure that we are investing it in the right place and we have to make sure that government is not paying for something that the commercial sector would have definitely been doing. We need to make sure we get that right in some ways the timing is uh, quite fortuitous that we are, as we would anyway, have been uh, looking at precisely how we format that spending. We need now to think of it, I think, uh, also as £5 billion to stimulate the economy when the economy really needs it. But we also need to make sure we're stimulating it in the right place. And you're absolutely right to say uh, some of those areas that we wouldn't have thought of as uh, commutable. Um, maybe now, if you're only going in one or two days a week, then you're much more prepared to spend some time uh, on a train that previously would have been unacceptable or in a car that previously would have been unacceptable. So uh, a little bit premature to go into the detail, I think, but absolutely right to, to say that government should be thinking about it, and we are. The next challenge, I've, I have got an eye on the clock, so I know we're really counting down to your last minute here. Just quickly then, so chunks of £5 billion pounds are going to be harder to get your hands on uh, post-COVID with the, with the huge investments that the government are making to save the economy, to support the economy. Um, the biggest beneficiaries of COVID-19 and the lockdown have been uh, the technology industry, whether it's selling laptops, connecting people, Netflix, you know, and all the rest. Mm. Do, you, do you think it is worth having a look at some sort of one-off tax to that industry, Pat, you know, or some sort of mechanism to try and make sure that, that the UK captures some of that upside to, you know, to invest in more digital infrastructure and to to make a new style of economy work? I, I, sort of quite a tough question, but uh, well, maybe I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to tread on the toes of my treasury colleagues, but what, what I would say um, is actually what this has shown is that the UK has a huge opportunity um, to make the most of a tech sector that has really in, in lots of ways stepped up. Um, I think the best way of getting more taxes into the treasury is to grow those businesses so that we are uh, taking a, a small slice of a larger cake, um, and that's how you'll get money into uh, funding the infrastructure upgrades that we need to agree to an even greater extent uh, in the future. But I do think, uh, on the other hand, you are obviously right to highlight uh, that certain areas of the economy uh, have done uh, very well in these extraordinary circumstances. Um, and what we do need to do, I think, is need to look in the future at what are the areas that will need support and what are the areas uh, that have been uh, able to find ways through in a more successful manner. Brilliant. Pat, you've been incredibly generous with your time. You now have to imagine uh, everybody applauding. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lack a little feedback from the room, but I that you have been very generous with your time and very open with your answers to our questions today. So, so thank you so much for joining us, and I will uh, bid you farewell. Thank you Pleasure. so much. Thank you ever so much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, uh, that was a great opening keynote, I thought, and uh, thank you to the Minister for uh, answering your questions, my questions, and being really, uh, I think, pretty open about uh, some of the challenges and opportunities. And there were some ideas that came up there around smart cities and, and new sort of new distributions, ways of working, uh, and impacts on cities that I think we all know are there. And I think that's what we now hope you're going to talk about. Uh, so we've got 15 minutes now uh, of table working, table discussion. Uh, please move to the top of the room, to that front row of tables. Uh, try and get five, four, five, six of you on a table to have a, a really good discussion. Uh, to move to a table, you put your mouse on it, you double click. Uh, you have 15 minutes. There'll be a clock that counts down across the top to give you an idea of how long you've got. But when we come back to the stage, I'm very pleased to say we have uh, Alison mackenzie Folan, CEO of Wigan Council, Deborah Colville, uh, city manager at Smart Belfast, Liz St. Louis from Sunderland City, where they have a billion pound of investment into their digital infrastructure, and Jane Pritchard uh, from Treehouse Innovation with us for a panel talking uh, about smart cities and smart places. So I'll see you in 15 minutes. Enjoy. <laughs>